So I'm sitting, I'm talking here with Dr. Dr. Freed, um, the CEO of Telstra Clear, about um, ultra fast broadband. Um, when I was doing my UFB trial, one of the things I very quickly learned is that that getting very fast internet into your computer is not a straightforward matter. It's not simply a matter of having a modem in the, in the cupboard which is capable of delivering you 60 megabits per second. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. So first of all, I discovered that that, um, that the cable modem I had couldn't really communicate with my router, which even though it was spec for 100 megabits per second, sort of didn't really cope with anything more than about 12. <laughs> um, and similarly, all the XP, um, Windows XP machines I had in the house couldn't cope with any more than about 12 or 13 megabits per second either. So I upgraded the router, um, got a new laptop, which I actually already had, which, which was Windows 7 and 64-bit, and um, at that point I could see some real speed. So one of the issues there is, 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 um, is getting, um, I mean, one of the issues with the rollout of ultra-fast broadband is going to be the need for, for people to upgrade their, their computer systems in their, in their houses. Look, I, I think um, just a couple of points. The first is, and I made the point before about ultra-fast broadband can be independent of the network, but perhaps more importantly, one of the assumptions made by the designers of this network in New Zealand is that demand is homogeneous. Everyone will want 100 megabits per second. Um, that's something we would contend is not true from mainly from uh, the last five years of selling broadband and also from a lot of market research, which again speaks to our point that we think this, uh, if you define ultra fast as being you know 30 megabits to maybe even 15 up to 100, then you can meet a lot of consumer needs um, over copper, which has a lot of life in it. Uh, wireless, which is incredibly important with 3G and then 4G, uh, HFC and then fibre. One of the assumptions again being made is that so-called local fibre companies, whether it be North Power or Telecom or Chorus, will be responsible to building the network to the home in a little box on the side of the house and thereafter it's down to the retail service provider and the customer. Um, they've also made an assumption that's going to be very easy to do inside the house. Uh, we would say, as indeed your experience, our experience is that it's anything but easy. Particularly when you enter a house and they want to run a wireless system in the house as well, uh, from their modem. Uh, I've never met a CP, a customer premise equipment, that requires only one truck roll to get right, which is the visit by the technician to the house. Generally, uh, particularly in the early stages of technology, it can be anything to two to three truck rolls to make sure and then on top of that, something like a geeks on wheels, having to go back and get everything set up and working. And, and again, I think it reflects that we're at the front end of this technology. Um, uh, in our house, we have probably six or seven computers. That's two desktops and maybe between uh, three laptops and another four wireless um, pieces. Uh, of equipment, and even then I suspect I'm underestimating it. Uh, when I think about the DSs and the Nintendo um, Game Boys that float around that are uh, internet capable, uh, that's all running off a wireless system that took a long time to get right. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm in the trade, so to speak, and mm. have been able to get um, some help in setting it up. So, you know, and my biggest dream is one day to have all this with no wires at all out the back of, you know, the DVD players and everything else. So um, again, I think that is going to be an issue for this type of network. Um, house wiring, uh, the type of um, uh, services customers want to run on, uh, and that's not priced in anywhere. Uh, well, there's another thing that just, it's just occurred to me too, there's also security issues. I mean, if you, if you have, have networks which are capable of receiving and transmitting at 30 or 40 or 50 megabits per second, they can cause a lot of havoc. Uh, and it's not only that, I mean, I, I live, um, a couple, in fact, about the three or four of our neighbours are all pretty um, technology savvy, and if I knew their passwords, I could use their Wi Fi wi network instead of my own, you know. Um, mm. And our houses are quite a distance away, but there's all types of security issues. Um, mm. uh, and, and what you thought, again, this comes down to convergence in behaviour, and I always feel when we build these types of networks, we're way behind, um, you know, behaviours. This is a generation that, that that can go down Lambton Quay 
and there's at least on our last count anywhere between 180 to 200 Wi-Fi uh, networks down Lambton Key alone. Um, I was overseas with my daughter who we walked into a mall uh, and she turned off her 3G, turned on the Wi-Fi immediately, um, picked up the mall Wi-Fi and started freeloading. I call it freeloading because uh, it's free for her of, of that network. And then immediately started through Facebook talking to a sister in New Zealand about what handbag she was going to buy. Um, you know, they're way ahead of networks, they're way ahead of speed uh, and, and how we're using them. And there's a lot of hidden costs um, in this network, which is fine as long as people are honest about them, but those costs will tend to fall back on uh, service providers like us to try and explain to the customer uh, and try and deal with. Right. So, um, Didn't sound very impressed by that. No, no, I was, I was terribly impressed, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps slightly more impressed though with the, um, with the telecommunication group that's formed um, to be concerned about the USB initiative. So the coalition that's brought together telecommunication companies um, includes Call Plus, Cordia, Orcon, which is, is actually the government, um, Telstra Clear, Vodafone, Two Degrees, Opto Network, Toro Toro Wire. Mm. Who, who are they? They're a Mary group associated with, I think, um, either telco interests or have interests in developing internet use by Mary. And there's Federated Farmers, Consumer New Zealand, two Great, ends, yep. Internet NZ. Tell us a little bit about how this group came together. Well, I think, um, you know, the establishment and introduction of the UFB plan uh, was greeted probably with enthusiasm um, to a greater or less degree by everyone in that group, including ourselves, although we had some misgivings about um, the assumptions around demand by consumers and the speed of the build. Then, without consultation and quite unannounced, two pieces of legislation were tabled in Parliament uh, and done in such a way that you really had to be looking out for it to understand what was going on. The first piece was a piece of legislation called the Ultrafast Broadband Bill. Um, and in itself, that was a little concerning, but you would have said, well, maybe we could live with that. Uh, but then the second, the killer piece, was tabled um, after Christmas, well, uh, um, during Australian Prime Minister's visit, actually, called the Supplementary Order Paper for the Separation of Telecom. And those two bills together take us back 20 years to the days of the old telecom monopoly. Uh, and effectively they do that by providing the builders um, of the ultra-fast broadband network a 20-year holiday or protection from the Commerce Commission being involved Ten. in looking at prices. Sorry, 10 years. I was thinking of the 20-year period. Yeah, that was a broad mm -hmm. end It will seem like 20 years, I can assure you. Um, and I think not a lot was said about that and then Telstra clear that started to begin getting very vocal uh, and I think we were a bit like a crystal um, and a chemist experiment really you know we we provided the nuclear sort of foundation on which many of these groups then began forming and talking to each other um, and we provided a lot of the initial arguments uh, and maybe the um, uh, outrage <laughs> factor that came into this piece of legislation. Um, and again, you know, a lot of our uh, issues are around the type of protection that's been given to the builders. Um, some of the more outrageous aspects of that bill not only give protection to the network from price competition, um, they give protection to the builder from parts of the Commerce Act, which would prevent them from taking over other companies that would give them a dominant position. Uh, so the so-called um, uh, this anti-competitive test that the Commerce, um, Commerce Commission can apply. The only other time that's ever been removed from the equation is when Fonterra was formed. And so they wouldn't. So they. So they wouldn't. I didn't realise that. So this yeah, parts two and three of the Commerce Act, um, chorus two would be carved out from that. So like Fonterra, they wouldn't have to go before the Commerce Commission before before they could buy North Power or could buy buy Unison or Enable and Christchurch if they wished. Mm. Um, as we have um, challenged the minister, if your intention is not to create a monopoly, then why then just remove those? Why would you have those in there? In those the first place? Yeah. Um, so, you know, after 20 years, re remember many of the companies involved in this environment, Call Plus, 
not just us, Tel Clear Communications, Telstra Saturn, Call Plus, um, some of the others, you know, it spent 10 to 15 years trying to get a foothold in competition with no government money, no government protection um, from that. Finally got the loop unbundled, finally had a level playing field with a referee, what we call the Commerce Commission, uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, one bill to end it all, really. Uh, and it all goes backwards. So, Thanks. I was just thinking, maybe we should go back, back a little, a little bit and explain a little bit how this this works. So, the Ultra Fast Broadband Initiative, as I understand it, um, essentially asked all the players to tender pricing for what they would charge for services. And the intention was that that they would build networks, which everybody would then theoretically be able to sell services over, and there would be a there would be like a set price for access at a wholesale level to that network, which is sort of similar to the way telecom wholesale sort of works at present, isn't it? In the sense yeah, it's not quite absolutely correct in, in that first the government passed a piece of legislation that said that telcos like us couldn't build and own the network, the ultra-fast broadband network. We would have to separate our retail um, from our infrastructure arm. Uh, and that was clearly discriminatory. That was clearly in favour of utility companies. Um, and that was clearly, you know, you couldn't do anything about that. So we were left with a choice. We either separated, which just destroyed the value of this company. And the, of Telstra. Yeah, and our ability to do the innovation and the things we do. Because we've never been in favour of separation of telecom, ever. Uh, or we made an investment in a company we couldn't have control over the capital. We don't do that. When we put millions of dollars into something, we like to have a say in what that meant. So under the legislation, we couldn't build or invest as a local fibre company and have over 50% shareholding. So we said, well, you've cut us out from building the network. Um, uh, we made our thoughts clear on that, but clearly if someone else wants to go and put their capital in building, it will be very happy to be the second biggest retail service provider, because the first biggest will be whatever telecom retail becomes, uh, but with open access and under the right terms and conditions. Um, then all of a sudden, what comes out is the wrong terms and conditions, which is <coughs> the removal of the referee, the Commerce Commission, um, from being able to look at the prices being offered to uh, retail providers and say, look, those prices are not fair or inequitable. Uh, a 10 year protection for that to the investors. Um, the reducing of the threshold of the test, the test today for telecom to provide services to itself, that is between telecom wholesale and the retail, as, and then to us as one of the equivalents. So there is absolutely no way they can provide anything less to us than they can provide to themselves. Uh, the test for the UFB is one called discrim discrimination, which is a lower threshold, which means not only can they do that, when they do it, they get hit with a wet bus ticket instead of a $10 million fine. Well, who, who, would, who would be responsible for, for doing that? Do well, it? Crown Fibre Holdings, because it's not only the investor, it's a regulator. But they're, but they're a co-owner. Correct. This, this, there you have the problem. The referee and the owner. Yeah, but there you have the problem. In this. So we've said, look, we've said, look, we're open to compromise. And I think because of that, you've seen an unprecedented grouping. I don't think we've ever had it. Normally we're at each other, two ends and us, the telcos, and Consumer New Zealand about things, coming together and saying this is bad for consumers because consumers will have higher prices over the next five to eight years, less choice, and will not have a referee to turn to. It's, it's as simple as that. And uh, all we've asked is either remove the regulatory holiday, allow the Commerce Commission in, which wouldn't require much of a change to the Act, and in any case, it has to come back to the Minister. The Commerce Commission always makes a recommendation to the Minister anyway. So it's not as if, you know, we're taking it away. Or alternatively, there's this mechanism called a special access mechanism, uh, where up front you all agree what the price is, is to be and everyone knows what it is and understands the terms and conditions and the Commerce Commission is still in it. So it's, it's not only is it offensive, um, it's outrageous in, in many respects.